Hi guys, and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. Today's case was requested by Umi Sumon 238 So thanks so much for requesting this case. You guys know how passionate I am about women and children and sharing their stories, especially. So when I looked into Samia Shahid's case, it broke my heart. So content warning, we are going to be talking about an honor killing the most vile and sick reasons that women's lives are taken away. The way that marriage and family traditions and cultures can be used against women to cover up horrific crimes. Samia was tricked by those she trusted the most. Her life was taken supposedly for love. So before we jump into this really serious topic, I wanted to address some of the comments that I most likely will get on this video as well. I've gotten it on a lot of my South Asian cases. A lot of people can comment and be like, what do you understand? You don't know anything about it. Like, why am I even talking about it? And I wanted to say, you don't have to be the same race to bring awareness to something. You can just be passionate about it. But in saying that, this next part of the video hopefully will make you understand why I am so passionate about these cases. So we're gonna go into a little light moment before we get into the more serious topic. Before we jump in, I wanted to talk about the hundreds of comments I get about my ethnicity. I know a lot of you guys are curious about where I'm from and I have to say, I do have a pretty interesting background and early life, but today we're going to get those answers together. I am so happy to be partnering with My Heritage. I have been wanting to do this for the longest time, so I was so excited when I received my kit from My Heritage. My Heritage is the leading global family history and DNA service and makes exploring your family history easier than ever. It's so easy to use, just a simple cheek swab takes two minutes, which helps you discover your roots and find new relatives. My Heritage also covers more regions than any other test, and your DNA results will reveal a percentage breakdown of your origins across 42 supported ethnicities and 2,114 geographic regions. That's a lot. And you can find new relatives based on shared DNA. What was important to me is that My Heritage is committed in its privacy policy to never share or license genetic data. Okay, so it's time to check out my results. I have Jay here, kind of behind the camera. He's gonna be looking at it with me. Okay, should we go? Should we click it? Let's go. Why am I nervous? I'm like nervous. <laughs> my heart's beating. Oh. One hundred percent. Nothing else. <laughs> That's it. I thought it was gonna be like mixed. What? Okay. Oh my god. Is that what you thought? That's not what I thought. Oh. Go on. Oh well. <gasps> oh, because my ancestors. Genetic, additional genetic group is Portugal. Makes sense. That's what I've been telling people. <laughs> Oh my god. So I'm just a hundred percent. You know, I told you, I was like, what if I'm just a hundred percent South Asian? <laughs> oh my god. So what does all this mean? I'm not These are that. the different groups, yeah. I'm hundred percent. Do you know you're married to a hundred percent South Asian person? <laughs> that is wild. Well, there you go, guys. That's what that's what I am. I South Asian. I'm um, shocked. Nobody one extended family. I have no one. I have distant relatives. Is that what you expected? <laughs> hey, I know him. <laughs> oh, a little bit of UAE. <laughs> I'm a little bit Arab, right? <laughs> so majority of my relatives are in the UK. I have six in Australia. And then France, Sweden, Portugal. Portugal. Two. I was expecting like 30. 100%. I just was not expecting that. That's wild. Where is that? <laughs> what is that? Goa. Goa. Yeah. Well, guys, <laughs> I'm from Goa. <laughs> so Oops. I think that shocked me the most. Either my parents really lied to me and told me about like all these people that I'm related to. I was expecting a little bit of like maybe Egypt, maybe Saudi Arabia, something. 
but it's really gonna put me 100% South Asian. <laughs> cool. Like, I swear I know him. <laughs> I swear my parents have talked about him. <laughs> These ethnicity estimates, like most people have like so many people, like countries. Why do I just have the one? Well, you're, you're pure. <laughs> Is that, <laughs> is that what you guys thought is like did any of you guess that i was from india i don't know if i feel like nobody guesses india for me i always get like other countries i get a lot of mauritian arab, um, arab. i get a yeah, lot of arab egyptian, countries egyptian like that, yeah this is really trying to Portuguese. play me like this is really going to give me a hundred percent i can't even they're, lie anymore to people they're teasing you with with this, this tiny Portugal, bit, a tiny bit of Portugal genetic group. That's wild. <laughs> that was so fun. And you guys, my heritage has a promotion going on right now. So click the link below in my description box to get your DNA kit and use code Zara V for free shipping. Thank you so much to my heritage for sponsoring today's video. And thank you so much to you guys for all your support. Samia Shahid was born on November 15th, 1987 in Bradford, West Yorkshire in the United Kingdom. And I watched a documentary on this and they pronounce her name as Samia. And I don't know if that's a UK thing or a Pakistani thing, but I believe in India, they would say this name like Samia. So let me know in the comments, what do you guys pronounce this name as? I love her name. So she grew up in Bradford and Bradford is a city located in the northern part of England and it's known for its diverse population and cultural heritage. Lots of people from the South Asian community, including people of Pakistani descent are from here. And they have a pretty big community there and that's where Samia was originally from. Samia's parents, uh, Chowdhury Mohammed and Imtiaz, her mom, moved to the UK from a small village called Pandori in Pakistan. And they moved to the UK in search for better opportunities for their family, like many others do. Samia also had a sister named Madiha and growing up in a city like Bradford, Samia and Madiha, they grew up with a mix of British and Pakistani influences. As a second generation immigrant, she likely bounced between these two cultural worlds, balancing the values and traditions of her Pakistani heritage, but also assimilating with the realities of a Western country like the UK. The Shahid family and their relatives were pretty well known in Bradford, mainly due to the amount of businesses a lot of the family members ran in the community. So Samia's parents owned and ran a car hire and limousine hire business. Her uncle ran a fish and chip shop and another uncle owned a florist. Her mom, Imtiaz, had five brothers and they were just all known locally and Samia loved her family. She had so many cousins and nieces and nephews and just loved her big family. Samia herself was known to be very friendly, funny, popular, had a ton of friends. She was headstrong, loved fast cars, she was confident, she was loving, she was bubbly, and she was the apple of her father's eye. It was clear to everyone around them that she was really a daddy's girl. She loved her dad and her friends say that she would have done anything for her dad as her dad's word was law in her eyes. Although Samia and Madiha were given the freedom to enjoy a Western upbringing, given they were living in the UK, it was only to a certain extent. Her family valued and stayed true to their faith, which was the sunny Muslim faith and their Pakistani culture. So Sunni, or is it Sunni? Sunni Islam is one of the two major branches of Islam and the other one being Shia Islam. But Sunni Islam is the largest denomination within Islam comprising of, I believe the majority of Muslims worldwide. So in her family, certain rules had to be followed. And even though Samia loved fast cars, she was not allowed to drive. Her friends claim that she would hire a car on the down low and then drive like crazy, wild and reckless. Some sources claim that Samia was a beauty therapist slash makeup artist, but I don't believe that was her actual job. I believe that was more of a hobby and she actually had a job working at a post office in Bradford, but I don't believe she was working full time. Her friends claim that she barely worked, but because she was a daddy's girl, she would get whatever she wanted. Her father would finance her. And before I talk more about Samia, these are all accounts of her friends and articles and things like that. But 
her sister Madeha has a different take and version of their life. So I just want to say that all of this information is literally just word of mouth. But in saying that, her friends said that in their Pakistani culture, the values were that whatever happened, family came first. It's family above all, and that was that. So even though it seemed that Samia got whatever she wanted, at the end of the day, what she wanted the most was her family's approval, no matter what decision she had to make. She loved them a lot, but she could never be truly open with them. Everything was a secret. And I can totally relate. I feel like my dad especially was so strict growing up that he like knew nothing. <laughs> Sure, he knows now. In 2012, Samia is now 25 and her parents felt it was time for her to, I guess, grow up. She had been living a somewhat free westernized life and her parents felt she needed to now get married. One of her friends stated that her mom, Imtiaz, would approach her and tell her, you know, encourage Samia to go to Pakistan and get married. In Pakistani culture, arranged marriages are pretty common and Although it's not required by the Sunni Islam faith, it's encouraged and kind of expected. So when Muhammad, her father, and Imtiaz, her mom, approached Samia with a chosen husband, Samia agreed. Not because she wanted to, but because she felt she needed to. She took her culture and heritage seriously and did not want to disappoint her family. And she would do anything to make her family proud. In February 2012, it was decided that Samia was going to marry a man named Chowdhury Muhammad Shakil. We'll call him Shakil because he kind of has the same name as her dad, so Shakil. Shakil was not somebody that Samia had expected as her husband. He was from their village, Pandori, in Pakistan, and I guess the biggest issue of all was that he was her first cousin. Shaquille was like a brother to Samia, not a husband. She had known him since they were kids, little kids. And on top of that, he had just been released from prison for shooting another man over a dispute about land. So he wasn't very attractive on paper. I mean, shooting someone and he's my cousin. But it's not uncommon for British Pakistanis to marry someone in their family like their first cousins. Her friends stated that it's believed that you should be marrying your first cousin basically to keep your land that you own in Pakistan in the family. It expands the family inheritance, I guess, because all these individual families come together as one family and then they have all this property, right? And it's basically like winning the lottery. Samia's parents were also first cousins and had an arranged marriage and made their marriage work. So to prepare for her wedding, Samia was taken to all the different Pakistani stores to get everything she wanted, the gorgeous outfits, the fancy jewelry. Her father, Muhammad, paid for it all. But Samia knew that money was not going to buy her happiness. She tried to get excited planning for the big wedding, but wasn't really truly happy with the choice in a husband that was made for her, but at this point she had to go along with it. She confided in friends that even though her parents wanted what they thought was best for her, she didn't really know if this was the right path for her, this marriage with Shaquille. She felt suffocated because she had to put on this big smile for her family. She wanted to make them happy, but inside she wasn't listening to her heart, to her mind, and at the same time she also didn't want to bring shame upon her family. Something that is kind of ingrained in you that your family, family's name is important. In mid-February 2012, when she was getting on a plane to fly to Pakistan, she texted a friend saying, I can't believe this is actually happening. I'm dying, I swear, my life's a joke. However, it's important to note that her sister, Madiha, um, disputes a lot of these claims. She says that Samia had a number of marriage proposals to choose from and that she chose Shaquille. That yes, it was an arranged marriage, but it wasn't a forced one. And there is a big difference between arranged marriages and forced marriages. When she first arrived in Pakistan to meet 
her future husband Shaquille, she told friends that she couldn't even look at him and that she was happy she didn't actually throw up on him when she met him. So Samia and Shaquille had a big wedding. So many people from Bradford came down to Pakistan to celebrate. On 27th February 2012, the four day ceremony began with over a thousand guests. And I know you're thinking a thousand people, that's wild, right? Well, it's not so wild because my parents, they had a thousand people at their wedding and they had a Catholic wedding. It's a, it was a bit different. It wasn't a four day ceremony, but a thousand people, a thousand plates of food. Yeah, crazy. As a wedding gift, her father, Muhammad, gifted the couple their very own house. And this house was actually next door to her own family home in the village of Pandori. After the wedding, Samia and Shaquille moved into this home and lived together as husband and wife. But Samia could not adjust to the idea. She was from the UK, but now she was expected to just change her life and live in this small village, something that she wasn't comfortable with or used to. Despite this, Samia lived in the village, in that home for four months before returning back to the UK, Bradford in June, 2012, without her husband, Shaquille. Shaquille remained in Pakistan pending his immigration application while Samia went back home to live with her parents. Samia basically went back to the UK to apply for a spousal visa for Shaquille, um, after which, if he was granted it, he would move to the UK to live with Samia. So their wedding in Pakistan took place as a nikah ceremony, which was in accordance with Pakistan's Sharia law. And in Pakistan, it is considered a registered court marriage. So this case kind of deals with marriage validity, I guess. So some sources say that due to it being legal in Pakistan, right, it qualified as a legally recognized marriage under British law. But when I looked into the Marriage Act, 1949 UK, there are certain legal requirements in the UK to consider a marriage legal. So one of them being a civil ceremony at a registered office in the UK and being issued with a marriage certificate legally confirming the marriage. So from my understanding, if they only had the nikah ceremony in Pakistan, the marriage was not legal in the UK because they didn't follow the required steps. But in saying that, if you got legally married in another country, right, wouldn't it be recognized as legal all around the world? I'm confused. Comment below if you can elaborate further on that. So upon her return to the UK, her friends noted that Samia was her happy and kind of normal self around them, but she had resentment towards her parents. She was bitter and not herself when Shaquille was in the picture or talked about. She felt he was constantly watching and tracking her every move because although she was in an entirely different country, he insisted that she call him daily via video chat on Skype and remain in contact every single day for most of the day. He wanted her to sit there on Skype and just be with him so he could watch her. She would say, he's always on my tail. She felt trapped. And I was like, doesn't he have a job? Like, doesn't he need to stay busy? But maybe, you know, when he was at home in the night, maybe the time difference, he wanted her to stay there with him. On 29th July, 2012, she left a voice note to a friend praying that she would die. She claimed she didn't want to live anymore. She hated her life. So there is a documentary on this case available on YouTube. I will link it below for you guys if you want to watch it. But in that, they show Samia with this horrific black eye dated August 2012. So it's clear, allegedly, that Shaquille, you know, terrorized her in more ways than one. But... Again, her sister Madiha kind of disputes this. And in August, 2012, she was in the UK. So maybe the picture was actually taken at a different time, but I'm thinking August, 2012 is when she sent it to her friend. In December, 2012, after about six months living in Bradford, Samia went back to Pakistan to live with 
Shaquille, but things were not better. And Samia was still not happy, according to her friends. Now, I think it's important to show the other side of the coin because some others who knew Samia, like the store clerk at the Pakistani store who helped her pick out her dresses for her wedding, her sister Madiha, and some others have claimed that Samia was extremely happy in her marriage to Shaquille, that she gushed about him to people she worked with, to some of these store clerks, that she would show pictures of her big wedding to everyone she knew, that Samia booked her own return ticket to Pakistan in December 2012, that if she was so miserable, why would she willingly go? So this is very different to Samia's friends' accounts in the documentary that she was so unhappy. But in the documentary, they do show a few voice recordings of Samia herself saying how unhappy she was. So I'm just giving both sides of the story here, I guess. In June 2013, Samia once again moved back to Bradford after living with Shaquille in Pakistan for six months. And I guess she was going six months on, six months off. This time, once she was back at home, her friends started noticing that Samia was resembling her old self. She was happier, more talkative, and laughing and wanting to be social. She then told her friends that she met someone new. This new man's name was Saeed Mukhtar Kasim, and to his friends, he was known as Ali. He was originally from Pakistan as well, but he had British citizenship and he worked in Dubai. They met each other initially online and began a friendship, and then they met in person in London in October 2013 and instantly clicked. Ali was everything Samia wanted in a man. He was loving, caring, supportive, and kind. He understood where she came from, and his feelings for her were also mutual. He felt that everything made sense in his life when she was with him. Now, if you've watched my video on Banaz Mahmoud or even just heard her story, a lot of this will sound familiar to you. Samia would have also known about her story and they both knew that they were risking each other's lives by being together, but they felt that their love was more powerful than the hate and the threat in front of them and that their relationship was something worth fighting for. Samia had told Ali about her current situation, how she was married to a man she considered her brother, someone who controlled her, and Ali couldn't understand how a father could turn his own daughter into property, something to be sold and traded for in his eyes. At this point, Samia knew she wanted to be with Ali, and for that to happen, she needed to divorce Shaquille. The divorce in my eyes is quite confusing, so, I believe she couldn't divorce Shaquille through the UK courts because they weren't legally married, right, in the UK, um, and they were married through Sharia law. So when she wanted this divorce, I believe it was through Sharia law that she wanted this divorce, not through the UK courts. So it's now May 2014, and Samia, she approaches Shaquille and she goes, yo, this isn't working, I want a divorce. He was like, of course, let's get a divorce so you can be with Ali. No, he did not say that. He refused. He was like, no way, we're married, you're my wife. But something I think is interesting and kind of cool is that under Sharia law, right, for a marriage to be considered valid, one of the requirements is that both parties, being the bride and the groom, have to give their mutual consent to the marriage. So I believe this is usually asked at the nikah ceremony, but I believe if it is found that there was any type of physical, financial, psychological, or emotional coercion, the marriage can be considered forced and voidable. So Samia, she turns to the Islamic Sharia Council of the UK. But first, Samia converted from the Sunni Islam faith to the Shia sect, which was Ali's faith, and she then visited a mosque to speak with the prayer leader, and his name was Mr. Kazmi, and he gave a statement saying, she told me under oath that her first marriage was a forced marriage, which happened without her free will as she was pressurized into the marriage by her family. So after she came and approached Mr. Kazmi, the prayer leader, with this information, Mr. Kazmi then wrote to Shaquille, 
Samia's husband and I guess asking what's your version of the events and Shaquille actually declined to give his uh, version of the events of the marriage and following this Mr. Kazmi Mr. Kazmi declared the marriage between Samia and Shaquille void. Two witnesses who supported Samia were with her when she signed these divorce papers and her family did not even know that this was taking place. Now, I'm not exactly sure how this happened given she was living with her parents in their home in Bradford at the time, but soon Samia and Ali had planned and organized their own wedding day in secret. Samia and Ali married in September 2014 in Leeds in secret. And I believe some of her friends knew and did attend and help her get ready for the wedding. Their nikah ceremony was performed by Mr. Kazmi, the same prayer leader who granted her divorce from Shaquille. Their wedding day was a really fun day. Samia told friends she felt like a princess, that she was beaming. She looked and felt so alive. Ali stated he was the groom the chauffeur and the photographer. They also registered their marriage in the English registry. Now you would think this would be Samia's happy ending, but no. Soon after in October, 2014, Samia was just walking with her cousin down this like alleyway when some guys jumped them, but only Samia was attacked. She was hit on her legs with metal poles. So her friends claim that this attack was clearly intended for Samia and Samia only. Samia did go to the hospital and reported her attack and injuries to the police. She suffered from large red and purple bruises all over her thighs. Now it is believed that this attack occurred because either her family or people who knew her family had found out that Samia had secretly wed Ali. So at this time, Ali had to return back to Dubai for work and Samia, she stayed in Bradford waiting for her visa to be able to go live in Dubai. Now, apparently after this attack, her family did know about this attack, but they allegedly did not help her. And um, she would apparently have arguments with her family over the phone and have the police on the other line. Like they didn't know the police were listening. And she did this to show the police the type of situation she was living in, how toxic it was, and maybe to have evidence. Samia soon became petrified of staying in her own family home. She felt like a prisoner. And if you've ever been in a family with, I guess, really strong opinions, values, beliefs, cultures, it can feel really suffocating. It can literally feel like you're about to die because you don't see a way out. You feel like you're going to be just trapped and controlled forever. You just don't, like normal things like just go to the police or just file a restraining order. They, they seem so massive and so huge. Like you're like, what's a restraining order gonna do? Like your mind doesn't let you believe that your life is your own when you've been raised and trained in, in a culture or family beliefs that you're supposed to be controlled. Samia was married to the love of her life. She could just leave, you know, they were adults, but she felt trapped mentally. In May, 2015, her parents had found out about Samia's divorce from Shaquille and they did not approve. Samia's family allegedly verbally harassed her and I believe it was mainly her mom, Imtiaz, as uh, she had notified the police of this. Ali was back in Dubai hoping things were gonna calm down, but it never did. They knew that if they stayed in Bradford, they would never be safe. Samia couldn't wait to be with Ali in Dubai, start her life, and some of her friends were actually helping her prep in secret for her ticket, her passport, etc. And one day in May, her spousal visa arrived, and then Samia, left the very next day. She just got on a plane and went to Dubai. And I don't even know how that happens given that, you know, she cared about her family's opinions and things like that. Like, how did she just leave, you know? It's crazy. But sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do, right? Like, for your own mental health. Now, immediately after she moved to Dubai, 
Her parents reported her as a missing person to the local police rather than just accepting that she was living life on her own terms. Now it's unclear when her parents actually found out about her subsequent marriage to Ali, but they did. And when they did, they went to Mr. Kazmi, the prayer leader. They wanted to seek some clarification from him and he tried to play dumb. Like, I don't know what you're talking about, but the family threatened him reportedly saying, Samia is missing from home and you know where she is. The issue will be resolved, but you will have to pay a high price for your role. So the family asserted that the marriage between Samia and Ali was not legal and not valid since the Islamic Sharia Council has no legal authority either in the UK or in Pakistan. So therefore, according to them, they were like, Samia is still legally married to Shaquille. And therefore her so-called second marriage was a sham and amounted to adultery. The police were notified by Mr. Kazmi and they gave him safety advice. Now it is claimed that Samia was incredibly happy in Dubai. She loved it. She was carefree, free to be in love, free from controlling people. And she explored Dubai. She posted on Snapchat about how amazing it was about her adventures. She drove often and she cooked. She was in love with Ali and she showed it all on social media. Ali and Samia could not wait to start a family. Samia so badly wanted to be a mom, but deep down, she couldn't let go of her own family. She wanted both worlds, her family life in Bradford and her new life in Dubai. Samia always wanted to raise her kids in the UK. She wanted them to be British. As hard as it is for some people to imagine, I can kind of understand how she feels, you know, like, you don't want that bad tension with your family just lingering over your head for the rest of your life. Samia loved her family. She wanted them to be happy for her, in love with Ali like she was. She wanted Ali to be close to her father, Muhammad. She would tell Ali, you know, he's a nice guy. He will like you. She spoke to her family nearly daily, trying to convince them that what she did was not wrong. In her mind, the way she was raised, the guilt imposed on her that because she did what she wanted without her family's approval, that karma was gonna get her back. Her father spoke to Ali and asked him to leave his daughter alone and Ali refused. He said, no, Samia is my wife. Her sister Medeha would tell Ali that their father did not like him, that he did not want to see his face. In Muhammad's eyes, her father, not only was Ali not part of the family, he wasn't a Sunni Muslim. On top of that, their marriage was done in secret without approval from her family. Reputation, honor, it's a big thing in some cultures. And Samya, in their eyes, had disrespected the Shaheed family name. People would talk and say to them, look what your daughter has done, look how she's behaving. And her family would feel ashamed. In June, 2016, Samya had learned that Shaquille's mom had passed away, technically her auntie. Samia was really distraught. She really loved her auntie a lot. She wanted to visit Pakistan for the funeral, but she knew there were risks, dangers associated with traveling there, especially when many people, including Shaquille's relatives, felt that Samia had disrespected them, had brought shame to their family by her actions. Ali advised her not to travel and she did agree that it was best that she remain in Dubai. At the time, Samia's father, Mohammed, had been struggling with his own health issues, including diabetes for a while. So soon her mother and her sister Medeha phoned Samia and told her that while they were in Pakistan, her father's health had declined and he may not have much time left. Samia could not forgive herself if her father died without her there by his side. So after struggling with her decision, Samia made the final decision to travel to Pakistan. Ali did not agree with her choice. He approached her when she was packing for a trip and he asked her, you know, how did you get the plane ticket? And she said, you know, my sister Madiha organized this for me. Ali Claims he was really upset, but he felt helpless because it was her father. How could he stop her? What if something happened to her father? He could never forgive himself. Although he didn't want her to go because he felt she was literally risking everything, 
he did drive her to the airport. And when she was about to leave, he said to her, you know, you can still change your mind. And she said, you know, nothing's going to happen to me. Don't worry. She had made up her mind and they said their goodbyes. On Thursday, 14th July, 2016, Samia was on a plane to Pakistan. Before the flight took off, Samia sent a text to her friend saying, pray I come back alive. When Samia arrived in Pakistan the first night, she stayed at a friend's house and over there she left her passport, documents and her return plane ticket for safekeeping. During this time, she was constantly in touch with Ali, letting him know that she was safe. While she was in Pakistan, she spent time with her family. She visited her auntie's grave with her father by her side on July 18th, 2016. On 19th July, 2016, Samia and Ali, they exchanged texts where Ali told her about this really bad dream that he had had. He didn't remember exactly what this dream was about, but it just really shocked him. In this text exchange, Samia said, pray for me to come back home safely to Dubai. She was due to fly back home to Dubai on 21st July, 2016. The next day, July 20th, Samia told Ali that she was going to the bazaar to buy food and was flying home the next day. So in response, Ali texts Samia, but he gets no response back from her. But strangely, the messages that he keeps sending her are showing up as read. Ali was extremely worried with the silence on her end. At around 1.30 p.m. that same day, the Pandori police station gets a phone call from a man who is crying and seems extremely distressed. This man speaks to an officer named Naveed and he says, my daughter has died. My daughter has died. The police soon arrive at a house in Pandori. They find a woman's body lying at the bottom of the stairs. She was dead. It was Samia. Her shoes were scattered around her. Her blue purse was set down by her feet. Her black scarf was covering her face. Under this scarf, Samia's eyes were closed and she had froth coming from her mouth. The man on the phone was Samia's father, Muhammad, and he tells police officers that Samia had been living there with her husband, Shaquille, and then he proceeds to show the officers where Samia had fallen and died. The officers then ask him, well, where is Shaquille? And he says, mm, I don't know. No one knows. No one had seen him since Samia had died. Samia's mother and sister flew down to Pakistan upon learning of her death, which kind of confused me because I thought they called her from Pakistan saying, you know, my father is sick. So I'm guessing they were in the UK and the father was in Pakistan and they had told her, you know, your dad's sick in Pakistan. So now obviously Shaquille's absence was suspicious to the police. An autopsy was conducted immediately and her body was then released to her family. Samia's family buried her the same day she died. But because the police report stated that Samia showed no injuries or signs of violence on her body, the death could not be viewed as suspicious. Now you're probably wondering why the hell did they bury her so immediately? Like looks like a cover up. But according to Sharia law, if there's no dispute in the manner of death, the burial has to be immediate. News started traveling fast and Samia's friends began to learn of her death. But they were mixed reports. Some were stating that she died from a heart attack or asthma attack. And then some stated that she fell down the stairs. Ali received a call from Samia's cousin, letting him know that Samia had died of a heart attack. Ali did not believe this at first. He thought it was some sick joke that they were trying to keep her trapped in Pakistan. And he immediately flew down to Pakistan. When he realized that it was true, he went to the Pandori police station and told them that Samia was murdered, that Samia's family was angry that she left her first husband Shaquille to marry him instead in 2014. And this obviously changed the view of the police on Samia's death. They now felt that this was a possible honor killing, but nothing 
could really be done because she had already been buried. When news spread about Samia's death in the UK, the BBC contacted Samia's father, Mohammed, and when they talked to him, he denied that Ali ever existed. He said her husband's name was Shaquille, they were happily married, Samia was happy in Pakistan, and Ali was no one. He was a blackmailer. Ali then received a copy of Samia's autopsy report. A 19 centimeter long reddish brown bruise was found on Samia's neck, around Samia's neck, let me clarify, and the cause of death was listed as suffocation. Seminal fluid was also found inside of her. It is believed that the police were bribed to cover this up initially. Ali organized a press conference in Pakistan and displayed the photos of the bruise around Samia's neck to the media. He wanted what happened to Samia to be publicized so he could find out what exactly happened to her. He needed round-the-clock protection from the police after this because he began receiving numerous death threats. Back home in Bradford, Samia's friends were receiving, I guess, mixed messages about her death and they knew that this would soon be covered up in Pakistan. So her friend Samira was in Pakistan at the same time as Samia and Samira calls their mutual friend Nuzba back home in Bradford and says, you need to report her death to the police. So Nuzba went immediately to the police back home and reported Samia's murder. Naz Shah was a member of parliament for Bradford West and received the news of Samia's death. She knew immediately that Samia was murdered. She wrote directly to the prime minister of Pakistan informing him of Samia's death. And when she wrote to him, she took the risk of naming Samia's murder as an honor killing. Now, obviously that's a huge risk because no one wants to be associated with that. No country, no parliament, no nothing. It was only after this that the Pakistani police took a closer look into Samia's death and then they formed a team of investigators. This did not go, you know, without any consequence as well because after this, Naz Shah started receiving death threats from Samia's family, allegedly. Eight days, okay, after Shaquille fled, he was found and taken in for questioning along with Samia's father, Muhammad. When Shaquille was interviewed, he told police that he wanted to keep Samia in Pakistan and end her marriage to Ali. He was angry that she left him, angry that he couldn't migrate to the UK. So he said on the morning of 20th July, he went through Samia's personal belongings, but he couldn't find her passport or return plane ticket. Now, obviously he was looking for these things because he was trying to stop her from returning back to Dubai. So around noon, he confronts Samia in his home and tried to pressure her into staying in Pakistan with him. Samia refused, and this obviously angered Shaquille, after which he forcefully threw her on his bed and raped her. The seminal fluid found inside Samia matched Shaquille. After the rape, Samia tried to run away from the home, the home she had felt trapped in for all those months, and Shaquille chased her down, wrapped her own scarf around her neck and strangled her to death. When Muhammad, her father, was questioned, he denied having any involvement and police did not believe his story that Samia was happily living with Shaquille as husband and wife. They believed that Muhammad and the Shaheed family and Shaquille's family, they felt disrespected by Samia's attempt to divorce Shaquille, marry another man who wasn't a Sunni Muslim, flee to Dubai, ruining Shaquille's chances of moving to the UK and just bringing shame to their entire family because what a horrific thing for a woman to do, try to live her own life. Now, I don't know where this evidence is. I couldn't find um, anything remotely proving this, but there are many articles talking about this and it's pretty gross. But allegedly when Samia tried to run away from Shaquille, she was then confronted by her own father who nodded his approval to Shaquille before holding down his own daughter's legs while Shaquille strangled her. Samia's father then tried to cover up her murder while Shaquille fled. The problem was the lack of evidence. Yes, forensic evidence showed she had been murdered, but 
who was the killer. In September 2018, after being held in police custody for two years, Shaquille was released pending trial. In 2019, he remarried a British Pakistani woman and applied for a spousal visa to enter the UK. I mean, he just found another one, right? Because that's what his ultimate goal was in the end. And uh, Naz Shah was the one to make sure that this spousal visa was denied. I don't believe he has ever been convicted even with his confession because it wasn't made in court as per Pakistani law and now cannot be used against him. So he needs to either confess again or who knows. After four months being held in a prison in Pakistan, Muhammad, her father, appealed to the high court in Lahore and was released as there was just not enough evidence to hold him in custody any longer either. In January 2019, Muhammad Shahid was hospitalized due to kidney failure and he soon passed away with his wife Imtiaz and his daughter Medeha by his side. It's important to note that a warrant for Imtiaz and Medeha's arrest was also pending, I believe in Pakistan, but it was discovered soon after this, after Samia's death, that they had fled back to the UK. Now again, to just show both sides of the story, both versions, Medeha again has completely different version of events. So she claims that those friends who were in the documentary talking about this whole thing were not even Samia's friends, that she had texts to prove it. And if you wanna read statements she has made, her claims, I will leave um, an article down below for you to read. And it's very different to the version I'm telling in this story. So it's interesting to know what the truth really is, but either way, whatever the truth may be, Samya was murdered. It's strange to me that her own sister, Madiha, is like, oh, you know, what happened to Samya? How did she die? You know, was it an asthma attack? When the autopsy clearly shows that she has bruises around her neck pointing to strangulation and suffocation, but again, her family believes that these images are all doctored. Samia's death has affected so many people's lives. Ali says that Samia completed him. His life will never be the same. Her friends will never be the same. They want justice for Samia, for the truth about her murder to come out. What Samia did was not a crime. It's normal to fall in love and make plans for your future. It's hard to know what the truth is in regards to the situation that Samia was living in. Her sister Madiha claims that they were free and never forced into anything by their culture, by you know their family, um, that Samia had apparently sent her text, which she shows, uh, while she was living in Dubai. She wasn't living a lavish life, apparently. Um, and Ali was in fact controlling Samia and taking her income. That Dubai was not what she was made to believe it was, that she just wasn't happy there. Madiha says that these claims have destroyed their family, tarnished their reputation, and they are now living in misery due to all these false claims. Whereas many others, including Ali, her friends, have a completely different account. The documentary fo focuses on the account that I've told here today. Um, and it's really hard because when I was first researching this case, I was like, oh, it's so black and white, you know, like she was miserable. But now with her sister's account and evidence that she produces in these articles, it's confusing because Samia did send her some texts of like pictures from outside the apartment in Dubai and like it wasn't lavish. Like they were apparently living in like a poor part of Dubai. But I mean, that doesn't change the fact that she did move to Dubai to be with Ali, someone that she loved. And maybe, you know, the life when she got there was not what she was expecting. And maybe she was just bitching to her sister about it. But the context that it can be taken in, it's like, what do you believe? Either way, Samia deserved to be free, living life on her own terms, whether she made mistakes or not. It doesn't change the fact that her life was taken. She did not die, you know, of an asthma attack, a heart attack. And it's wild that Shaquille is possibly living freely, even with a confession and evidence. Honor and killing are two words that just do not go together. Samia is one of many. And it's hard in these cases when it's your own blood who does the most 
damage. I would love for you guys to share your thoughts and any further information down below, as I know this case is a tough one. Please keep the comments respectful. Just think about her family. Rest in peace, Samia. And I hope you guys can kind of understand now why these types of cases are important to me. I mean, I've never experienced what these women have to go through. I mean, you know, cultures are interesting because we all experience similar things yet very different versions of it. So I'm not saying that, you know, I can understand even 10% of what these women have to go through, but it's important to me because I feel like these stories are not talked about enough and it's kind of shushed because it's such a hard topic to discuss, you know? So yeah, thanks so much for watching guys. And I will see you in next week's video. Besitos. Bye. Don't forget to check out my heritage guys. Click the link below in my description box to get your DNA kit and use code ZARAV for free shipping.